Hey everybody, Jason Burmis here, and you know, sometimes I sit and I go through these archives and I just find things that are so jaw-dropping that I did not intend on finding whatsoever. Earlier I was doing some research into Bilderberg, once again trying to find out where it was actually going to be held this year, and uh, look into some history of it. And all of a sudden, I found this video from 1999, okay? It's with a Yosef Badansky, okay? And Yosef Badansky, this is again in 1999, he is an author, he is a dual Israeli United States citizen, and at the time, he's actually the director of the Congressional Task Force on Terrorism and Unconventional Warfare. This is uh, Badansky uh, to the right of me. Uh, now, obviously, that was 20 years ago. So, why is this important? Well, Badansky actually wrote the book on bin Laden, literally. And when I say he wrote the book on him, uh, that's what this interview is. And it's about an hour-long interview. I picked out the first 15 minutes and I cut off one caller because I thought that that uh, one caller was basically just praising his propaganda. But I want to expose him for the propaganda that's he, that he's pushing. Because folks, he's pushing some propaganda in this. And before we get to that, I want to show you an older clip, uh, I'm sorry, a newer clip of Badansky after the 9-11 attacks. Remember, he writes the book on bin Laden prior to 9-11, okay? He basically sets up all this boogeyman talk, and we're going to get to that in a moment. Does tell a lot of truth. But later on, when we still haven't gone into Iraq, he absolutely links bin Laden and al-Qaeda. And by, by the way, in 99, he actually uh, links bin Laden and uh, Saddam Hussein, and we'll get into that. So he's linking them before 9-11. We all know that was war propaganda. There was no evidence to support that. But after the fact, we, we definitely know, and he definitely knew. So I'm going to bring this clip up. This is uh, from 2002, prior to the Iraq War, where he's trying to sell people that bin Laden... Uh, has been empowered by Saddam Hussein. And where do you see, hear the things he says? Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. I wanted to ask, is there a direct link between Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda in your view? Yes. Yes, and that, that's something that I've covered both in my previous book, uh, Bin Laden, that came out in 99, and more up to date in the current book, that uh, The High Cost of Peace. Uh, the relationship between Iraqi military intelligence, the guys who do business, and Islamist terrorist movement from which Bin Laden grew up and eventually took over, uh, goes back to 1992-93, uh, the fighting in southern Sudan against the rebel, and then the preparation of the elite forces that eventually confronted the United, the United States in Mogadishu. The relationship has evolved. If to, if to jump, and I'm really encapsulating, uh, in by 1998, in the aftermath of the U.S. attacks on uh, Iraq in February, relationship improved tremendously because the Islamists realized that Saddam Hussein was willing to provide them with training that other people would not. Let's stop. So now he's claiming that Osama bin Laden had Saddam Hussein train some of his al-Qaeda forces. Okay. Now, this all gets extremely convoluted, and not only that, he's going to say he provides them with weapons of mass destruction. Really? Oh, he provided Al-Qaeda with weapons of mass destruction, which they never found and they never used, and then Iraq, they never found weapons of mass destruction. And the reason that we're going over this first, prior to getting into the 1999 stuff, where he lays out the boogeyman, and by the way, is quite challenged. That's one of the reasons we're going to play this here. Uh, a couple of callers really take him to task, and it's some interesting stuff. But he's talking about all this support that Saddam Hussein gave to al-Qaeda. We are back, and for the next 50... Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda... ...in the aftermath of the U.S. attacks on... Uh, Iraq in February, relationship improved tremendously because the Islamists realized that Saddam Hussein was willing to provide them with training that other people would not, as well as for jumping point into crossing into Saudi Arabia. Saddam Hussein realized that the Islamists were willing to die and kill for him without him being implicated. This is a love-hate relationship. The Islamists initially 
never accepted Saddam Hussein's uh, ideology. They, they call him uh, an apostate, uh, a kafir, that they object to his secularity, but they realize that they can do business together and they against a common enemy, and it's working. Saddam Hussein has since provided them with uh, weapons of mass destruction. To weapons of mass destruction. He's going to say technology here. Weapons of mass destruction technology. Again, blurring the lines, blurring uh, the viewpoint here. Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda never had a real link. And this guy's telling you not only they have a link, but it's weapons of mass destruction technology. Technology advanced training that nobody else did. A lot of logistical support, communication support worldwide. Uh, bases to search from. Bases to search from logistical support. He's basically saying, hey, you know, Saddam Hussein might as well have been like the second commander in Al C. I mean Al Qaeda. Transfer point to the to Syria and to to Lebanon when they're coming from Afghanistan, and more recently, uh, again, advanced training that others did not do not have. Uh, Bin Laden, and in October, November 2001, when our attack on on Afghanistan. Uh, was picking up pace. Saddam Hussein sent emissaries to Bin Laden to offer him uh, shelter and shield in case he decides to leave Afghanistan. So again, he just said a mouthful there, this uh, Yosef Badansky, who the man who literally wrote the book on Bin Laden and warned us in 1999 of an imminent attack. So before we go into that, and we're going to play it in just a moment, it's pretty lengthy, I'm not going to lie, guys, but I think it's really worth picking about. This guy, still very much in power, you know, he's a guest speaker, dual Israeli citizen, a director of the Congressional Task Force on Terrorism and Unconventional Warfare, writes this thick book, basically brings the legend of Bin Laden to the American establishment, to the masses, and... Look at what he just propagated after the fact. How is he to be trusted? Very educated man. But you're going to find out, back in 99, he was even trying to tie Bin Laden in some way to the TW-8, or uh, the TWA uh, flight downing. TWA-800, if people don't remember that. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and speculate on that. It's a whole other issue. Um, but many have claimed that, that has all the earmarks of a uh, surface-to-air missile attack. And he portrays it as a bomb on board that exploded and may be connected to Bin Laden's network. But I'm rushing in. There's a lot to unpack here. I believe it's about a 10 or 11 minute clip. So uh, buckle up and let's get ready, guys. We are back, and for the next 55 minutes or so, we are joined at our table, and we'll be taking your calls. Our guest, Yosef Badansky, he is the cur currently is the director of the Congressional Task Force on Terrorism and Unconventional Warfare, and also an author, author of this book. It's a profile of Osama bin Laden. First off, Mr. Badansky, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Pleasure. What do we know about Osama bin Laden? A lot. Uh, he's uh, Saudi born to great affluence and influence of Yemeni extraction. He got westernized education, was drawn into Islam, radical Islam, by what he saw as fears to the civilization that he cares for. Let's stop it there. You notice he did say western education. He's going to be pretty honest here, and like I said, going to be taken to task, and actually be very honest about that as well. So, so let's continue fought in Afghanistan selflessly, was instrumental in uh, arranging the foreign uh, volunteers as well as the logistical and support system of the Mujahideen there. Uh, had a break with the Saudi royal family over the Gulf War, whether to allow the West into Saudi Arabia or not, i.e. would it be a war of Islam against Saddam Hussein or the war of the rest of the world. Uh, he was exiled to Sudan, where he became a uh, protégé of Hassan al-Turabi, one of the most important luminaries of radical Islam in the modern world. He learned a lot from him. He ended up in Afghanistan in 1996, established himself as a leader. He is probably the most important, most influential leader, guide, theolo uh, theological guide, uh, scholar of radical militant Islam today. Do we know where he is, exactly where he is right now? Let's stop it before he answers answers this, and this is where he starts to get a little bit more smug, but did you just hear how he built him up? He built him up as the leader, the most followed person of radical Islam, of jihad today. 
And now he's going to, well, do we know where he is? Do we know where he is right now? What can we do about it? And, and watch, he's going to talk about like a shell game. We think he's here and there, but then he's going to talk a little bit more. Well, he, he has five places where that he shuttles from. It's like um, a shell game. We know where the f five shells are. We don't know where the peak. Now, I ask you how you much we know about oh, uh, some of it. All sick? We don't know where to pick. <laughs> it's hard for me to believe that this guy is being genuine. I, I really do believe he knows what he's doing here. Again, you saw how we propagated the Al-Qaeda Saddam Hussein myth after 9-11 and he just talked about the shell which one to pick up in the Denver <laughs> you're gonna see some really weird body language when he's taken to task on a few things guys Laden and you refer to him as one of the most important figures in international terrorism I ask you that in part because there doesn't seem to be a lot at least reading from the media that that's known about him there are very few photographs for example I've personally only ever seen maybe about three photographs one of them is on the cover of your book yeah, no, that, that is about a dozen or so photographs of him. That, that's not the issue. There's a lot of photographs from uh, earlier ages. Uh, we know a lot about him. Uh, very little has been written in English until I sat down to type this book. But uh, do we know enough in order to stop him? No, we don't. See again? Look at him smirk. Do we know enough to stop him? No. We, how do you know? It's 1999. No, we don't. And And later... He's going to say either we're going to stop him or we're not. He's going to say make the same smirk. Like, why? I, I don't get it. Like, why are you holding back laughter? You say he's a scholar uh, and also very good about pursuing his agenda. What is it that, what is his agenda? Bin Laden believes that uh, for the Muslim world to assert itself in the post-Cold War, Cold War world, uh, the West must be banished from the hub of Islam, from all countries where Islam dominates uh, civilization, politics, uh, people's way of life. And uh, the only way he believes to do it, given the uh, omnipotence, the prevalence of Western presence through the internet, through uh, satellite television, through high technology, through weapons, through all other kind of influence, is to convince the Western governments to take away the values, Western values, and just leave the Muslim world with the high tech and other goods, consumer goods that they want to buy from us. So let me just stop it there. What he said basically was leave us alone. I mean, he doesn't even really paint a, a terrible picture. You know, he doesn't paint a picture of world dominance. He says, look, this guy basically wants us to leave militarily and leave our uh, Western influence. Okay. And uh, just leave the technology. They, they want to be technology forward. Listen, I, I'm not, uh, you know, obviously I'm not, you know, pro. Listen, you believe what you want, okay? There are certain aspects of many religions that I disagree with. But that alone, especially after serving the U.S. military uh, under the Cold War and fighting the Russians, which we're going to get to in this clip, by the way, uh, doesn't seem unreasonable. But now he's going to tag on but by the means of terror. Remember, we've already seen this guy smirk twice about this. It's a very tall order, and therefore he needs to go to extremes to convince us to do that, the extreme being terrorism at the heart of the West. Beaufort, South Carolina, good morning. Uh, good morning. I I'd like to start out by saying we're failing to realize what really is going on here. It's not bin Laden is not the problem. Why don't you hit the key point of the Illuminati? And if you don't know about the Illuminati, then you need to study on it, because that is the whole world new order, the new world order. Thank you very much, Beaufort, uh, South Carolina. Now, you see, like, you see his little mouth go, like, like let's watch it right there. He gets cut off, but, you know, he, he kind of maybe wanted to swing back a little bit. Remember, this is as far back as 1999. These are in the first days of the Internet. Um, this is when people were still listening to Bill Cooper. Bill Cooper was around. He's the biggest thing out there. Alex Jones was just emerging. You know, a lot of this stuff was circulating through uh, newsletters and John Birch Society meetings, uh, you know, churches, New World Order stuff. And right there, you know, you had somebody talking about the Illuminati. He just gets cut off, and this isn't really addressed. But we're, we're going to continue here. It's Again, watch his mouth here then you need to study on it because that is the whole world new order the new world order thank you very much Beaufort uh, South Carolina 
Thank you. Uh, I think Sel Bin Laden is probably the most important spokesman of the crisis uh, that affects the Muslim world today. It's a, it's a world of well over a billion people. Uh, he's a very, as I said, a very lucid individual, uh, erudite in expressing the problems as he sees them. And uh, he is a, at the grassroots level the most popular politician today or leader uh, throughout the Muslim world should not be ignored. I want. He says he is the most popular politician or leader in that area, one billion Muslims, and should not be ignored. Think about how, how much he's building up this legend, okay? 1999, this is really the big push where it changed, remember? Like, like it really changed. It changed, don't get me wrong, we had the Gulf War in the Middle East. We saw some movements there, but terrorism wasn't the real focus with... Uh, with uh, Saddam Hussein, okay? It was chemical weapons against other countries. That's a whole nother issue. But now to build up terrorism, well, this is the guy, all right? Remember, we had small level terror attacks in this country. The first World Trade Center bombing, yes, but you look at the Oklahoma City bombing, at least to the public, uh, it was never portrayed as Islamic in any nature. To uh, ask you about how he developed uh, what is his uh, sense of goals and missions, uh, but we are inviting international calls in this segment, and we have one uh, actually from the United States, a territory, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Good morning. Yes, I have one question I want to ask you. Uh, do you feel uh, conclusively that Bin Laden was responsible for Flight 800 going down? And secondly, do you think that was sponsored by the government of Iran and we didn't take a position against the government of Iran because of severe penalties that we'd have to inflict upon that country? Let me stop it there before he answers. Now, remember, Iran is still in the picture, but we've been beating the uh, drums of war against Iran. I mean, I was hearing about the Ayatollah in the 80s, so I get that perspective. But right now, again... They're trying to associate the Bin Laden network with TWA 800. And remember, if there was any real evidence of that after 9-11, that would have been all over the media. Now, watch his very calculated response. He's going to respond, there's not conclusive evidence, but... Uh, as I said in the book, uh, right now nobody has this, uh, determined conclusively the source of the spark. The general that, that uh, blew up the central fuel tank, the general dynamics of the, the explosion, the disintegration of the plane, uh, suggests nothing but a bomb on board. And there's been a series of warnings before coming from Bin Laden affiliated uh, sources before the bombing and claims right after the bombing. Bin Laden? affiliated sources before the bombing claims after the bombing this is an hour-long interview think about I mean this he's got a book he's introducing him to the public he's building up a Paul Bunyan type legend he's associating him with at the time one of the biggest scandals around uh, the, the bombing or the downing, I'm sorry, of uh, TWA 800, and therefore I think that right now the most credible option is an explosion on board the bombing. The caller also mentioned uh, involvement or uh, connection with the government of Iran. What do we know about Osama bin Laden's connections to? specific governments? Uh, Osama bin Laden is right now sponsored primarily by three governments. Uh, the government of Pakistan, the government of Iran, and the government of Sudan, at least before uh, Bashir uh, overthrew or neutralized Turabi a few weeks ago. Now let me stop you there. Remember, Sudan was really never talked about in that initial push of the axes of evil and the war on terror. However, the Pakistan link is extremely real. It's one I've covered time and time again in my films on 9-11 through his work with the Pakistani ISI and intelligence networks in the 80s in the Mujahideen, which we're going to get to. Remember, that was all revamped and all very interconnected to the fact with Joe Biden knowing that there was a role with the head of the Pakistani ISI wiring money, $100,000 to Ada just before the attack, even alleged to have met with two of the hijackers prior to 9-11 in a hotel in D.C., as we found out in the Dark Overlord documents. A lot of stuff in there. Um, you know, we've gone ad nauseum at some of those documents. Still thousands to go through. So much more. All right, so again, you've got this guy propping him up, propping up, uh, you know, again, the Iranian threat, which we still haven't tackled, but in the news this week, very possible. Sending the Abe Lincoln and a few other ships out there. Again, the Abe Lincoln was already planned, did a video on that, 
seemed like it was in the, in the uh, cards. But the Sudan, most people don't even know we're there. We are. AFRICOM is real. It was the next leg of this war on terror that is continuous after 9-11. The directly sponsored by those governments. Directly sponsored by this, gov this government here and his people. The main problem of, of the issue of Iran is complex, the, but in early 1996, and I'm kind of somewhat encapsulating it, um, the Iranians established what they called the Hezbollah International. It's a high command of the terrorists, the sponsor, underneath the Iranian intelligence, but they let Sunnis and other radical leaders that have great popular following uh, be in command of their own people rather than have direct on-hand control as the way the Iranians have over the Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, for example. And he's one of the key leaders of that Hezbollah International, one of the three leading uh, leaders and commanders, and is of great importance. He is also developing these days relationship with Iraq, but they are yet to become uh, operationally valuable. Uh, they're, they're still checking each other, shaking hands, patting on the back, but uh, we are yet to see a joint operation. Does he have relations with governments that are... Let me just stop you there. You see that? He, he's, they're talking about possible joint operations with both Iran and Iraq at that point. Let's continue. Perhaps uh, not direct, but a little bit more indirect and perhaps under under the board, under the radar screen? Oh, under the radar screen, he has a lot of, uh, of relationship, if not with government, then with senior officials of various governments who want... Friendly relations. Friendly relations. Uh, there are a lot of governments who would like to see him preoccupied with somebody else's rather than their own government, and therefore that they permit the flow of money, they permit uh, the look the other way in the flow of people, and things of that kind. Sterling, Virginia, good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Mr. Bodansky, maybe you can explain something to me. Uh, you were just talking about uh, Osama bin Laden's relationship with, with other governments and getting support. Let's just stop it. This guy knows what he's talking about. 1999, he's about to take it to him. It's not like that other caller who, hey, I'm sympathetic to. I'm glad that he brought up that the bin Laden thing uh, was very much a farce and not the real issue. However, this guy is going to hit him with some cold, hard facts that Badansky is going to uh, acknowledge and actually answer very honestly. He's going to prove exactly what I've been telling you. That yes, the United States sponsored the Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda networks. That is the reality of this situation. Isn't it, isn't it the fact that uh, our government, by supporting the KLA in Kosovo, which is trained and financed by bin Laden, and, uh, and also uh, chastising the Russians for what they're doing in Chechnya when the Chechens are also involved with bin Laden, uh, our government is helping to support him and actually uh, uh, establish bases for his, uh, his terrorist organizations around the world. And, and be before, you, before you get to that, that uh, um, perhaps you would also comment on what uh, Gail she said in her book about uh, after eight months of uh, virtual silence uh, between Mr. Clinton and uh, Hillary Clinton, she she encouraged him to bomb Kosovo, and the next day he made that move. Well, I I Oops. don't know about Gail she, so I'm going to skip that issue. Now let's stop. He brought up what was going on in that time period. He wasn't bringing up the Mujahideen. He wasn't bringing up, you know, Brzezinski going in there, radicalizing the Muslims, arming them, and starting that border war. But this guy's going to. So he's going to acknowledge what the caller just said, and then he's going to take it further and say, hey, sometimes they're U.S. interests. And he's even going to talk about the blowback phenomenon without using the term blowback. But let's go back. There's been, since the early 1980s, several cases where the strategic interest of the United States coincided with the strategic interest of the Islamists. It starts with the jihad in Afghanistan, when it was a paramount interest of the United States to block the Soviet slide into the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Ocean and in, support, in the Arabian Sea. And in, uh, in order to contain the Soviets, we supported uh, the Afghan Mujahideen, particularly the Islamists, the most militant Islamists among them and the most militant Islamists among them US strategic interests is that why we're working with Al Nusra and Al I mean Al Qaeda in Syria still 
Is that why there seems to be an affiliation with the United Nations White Helmets? And Al, C I mean Al Nusser, I mean Al Qaeda. I mean, it's only 2019. It's only 20 years after this. When you're laying out the boogeyman traps, we're talking about a lot of the same things, aren't we? History repeating themselves. Policies not changing. In so doing, empowered Bin Laden and other people. Uh, yes, we have supported in Bosnia and Kosovo, etc. We supported Islamic causes that eventually brought up the rise of uh, Islamist uh, terrorists uh, within the, the government uh, circles. You, you don't have to go far away. Uh, Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman of the World Trade Center fame uh, rose within Afghanistan and one of the leaders of the operations that ended up with uh, the capture of the truck in uh, Seattle, Washington uh, operated in Bosnia, was held senior position in the, the, the Jihad forces uh, in Bosnia in a, in a cause that we supported wholeheartedly and carries a Bosnian passport today. Yeah, so that's a problem. Same thing applies to Chechnya. The question is um, and I'm not trying to judge the decision makers in Washington, is when we look at a, a crisis in the world today, is what should we do? Concentrate on the immediate threat and how to solve it, irrespective of who potential friends, allies, or co-participants. Let's stop it there. Focus on the immediate threat and see who to support. He's fully admitting we fund both sides. He's fully admitting that when it is strategically in our favor, jihadists are our friends. And again, this policy has not changed. And now he's going to talk about the results of that, the blowback. But as I've always contended, yes, blowback does exist. But on the mass level and operation we saw on 9-11 with so many anomalies that I've gone over time and time again uh, in my films, Loose Change, Final Cut, Fabled Enemies, and now the many, many deep dives into the Dark Overlord documents that prove beyond a reasonable doubt that we have not been told the truth about that? No. It's all here. Let, let's let them finish up. ...are going to be, or to look several steps ahead and decide, okay, that byproducts are going to be so-and-so. I'm a firm believer that we should have looked care more carefully and think about uh, long-term effects and ramifications of what we're doing, rather than just concentrating on the here and now. And we're paying the price, and we'll continue to pay the price, because, as you say, we're now taking, uh, jumping on the Russians on Chechnya. Uh, we have empowered uh, the KLA in, uh, in Kosovo. We've empowered uh, the Bosnians, and we've, we've done some other mistakes along the way. Osama bin Laden is, uh, his name at least, is being linked to a developing story today. This is the story in the Washington Post. Hijackers demand release of Pakistani. It regards the, uh, the hijacking of the Indian Airlines plane. I believe that airplane, at least of, as of uh, several hours ago, was in Afghanistan. And this story, the link, this is from the paper Dawn that's published in Karachi, Pakistan. Jailed Muslim cleric at center of hijack has Bin Laden link. Now, the reason I played that little end there was twofold. Number one, they were openly connecting Bin Laden to every kind of jihadi terror plot. Two, we had plane hijackings again in the late 90s. And three, um, that hijacking itself was referenced uh, in several documents of the Dark Overlord, the 9-11 data dump that shows that there was a Pakistani funding arm of the hijackers that I've discussed for years. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the man who sold us Osama bin Laden, who sold us the boogeyman well before the attack and really set the stage for this guy to really become the face of evil, the quote-unquote Hitler of our era. If you like this video, hey, please knock those thumbs up. If you're not subscribed, what are you waiting for? Please subscribe. We do this all the time. We do it live and we do it with you. Hopefully, uh, I can go through some of the chats at the time and suggest what videos you guys want. You know, should I do more deep dives into 9-11 like this one? Should I do more MK Ultra stuff? Should I keep it as, uh, as new as possible? Did you enjoy the Simpsons video? Make sure to share this stuff on social media, guys. Thank you so much again for joining me. And who knows, maybe I'll return later on tonight with a Kissinger protege video of, uh, I believe, David Rothkopf talking about the quote-unquote New World Order and what it means to Henry Kissinger. Look for that one coming up in the near future. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you guys very much.